chapter thirty of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty grant's ride to appomattox how lee reached mclean's house meeting between grant and lee brief discussion as to the terms of surrender drafting the terms and the acceptance grant's consideration for the confederate privates rations for the paroled army it was proposed to the general to ride during the day in a covered ambulance which was at hand instead of on horseback so as to avoid the intense heat of the sun but his soldierly instincts rebelled against such a proposition and he soon after mounted cincinnati and started from kurdsville toward new store from this point he went by way of a crossroad to the south side of the appomattox with the intention of moving around to sheridan's front while riding along the wagon road which runs from farmville to appomattox courthouse at a point eight or nine miles east of the latter place general charles e pease of meade's staff overtook him with a dispatch it was found to be a reply from lee which had been sent into our lines on humphrey's front it read as follows april ninth eighteen sixty five general i received your note of this morning on the picket line whither i had come to meet you and ascertain definitely what terms were embraced in your proposal of yesterday with reference to the surrender of this army i now request an interview in accordance with the offer contained in your letter of yesterday for that purpose very respectfully your obedient servant r e lee general lieutenant general u s grant commanding u s armies pease also brought a note from meade saying that at lee's request he had read the communication addressed to grant and in consequence of it had granted a short truce the general as soon as he had read these letters dismounted sat down on the grassy bank by the roadside and wrote the following reply to lee april ninth eighteen sixty five general r e lee commanding c s army your note of this day is but this moment eleven fifty a m received in consequence of my having passed from the richmond and lynchburg road to the farmville and lynchburg road i am at this writing about four miles west of walker's church and will push forward to the front for the purpose of meeting you notice sent to me on this road where you wish the interview to take place will meet me very respectfully your obedient servant u s grant lieutenant general he handed this to colonel babcock of the staff with directions to take it to general lee by the most direct route mounting his horse again the general rode on at a trot toward appomattox courthouse when five or six miles from the town colonel newell sheridan's adjutant general came riding up from the direction of appomattox and handed the general a communication this proved to be a duplicate of the letter from lee that lieutenant pease had brought in from meade's lines lee was so closely pressed that he was anxious to communicate with grant by the most direct means and as he could not tell with which column grant was moving he sent in one copy of his letter on meade's front and one on sheridan's colonel newhall joined our party and after a few minutes halt to read the letter we continued our ride toward appomattox on the march i had asked the general several times how he felt to the same question now he replied the pain in my head seemed to leave me the moment i got lee's letter the road was filled with men animals and wagons and to avoid these and shorten the distance we turned slightly to the right and began to cut across lots but before going far we spied men conspicuous in gray and it was seen that we were moving toward the enemy's left flank and that a short ride farther would take us into his lines it looked for a moment as if a very awkward condition of things might possibly arise and grant become a prisoner in lee's lines instead of lee in his such a circumstance would have given rise to an important cross-country in the system of campaign bookkeeping there was only one remedy to retrace our steps and strike the right road which was done without serious discussion about one o'clock the little village of appomattox courthouse with its half-dozen houses came in sight and soon we were entering its single street it is situated on rising ground and beyond it the country slopes down into a broad valley the enemy was seen with his columns and wagon trains covering the low ground our cavalry the fifth corps and part of ord's command were occupying the high ground to the south and west of the enemy heading him off completely 
we saw a group of officers who had dismounted and were standing at the edge of the town and at their head we soon recognized the features of sheridan no one could look at sheridan at such a moment without a sentiment of undisguised admiration in this campaign as in others he had shown himself possessed of military traits of the highest order bold in conception self-reliant demonstrating by his acts that much danger makes great hearts most resolute fertile in resources combining the restlessness of a hot spur with the patience of a fabius it is no wonder that he should have been looked upon as the wizard of the battlefield generous of his life gifted with the ingenuity of a hannibal the dash of a marat the courage of a ney the magnetism of his presence roused his troops to deeds of individual heroism and his unconquerable columns rushed to victory with all the confidence of caesar's tenth legion wherever blows fell thickest there was his crest despite the valor of the defense opposing ranks went down before the fierceness of his onsets never to rise again and he would not pause till the folds of his banners waved above the strongholds he had wrested from the foe brave sheridan i can almost see him now his silent clay again quickened into life once more riding rienzi through a fire of hell leaping opposing earthworks at a single bound and leaving nothing of those who barred his way except the fragments scattered in his path as long as manly courage is talked of or heroic deeds are honored the hearts of a grateful people will beat responsive to the mention of the talismanic name of sheridan ord and others were standing in the group before us and as our party came up general grant greeted the officers and said how are you sheridan first rate thank you how are you cried sheridan with a voice and look which seemed to indicate that on his part he was having things all his own way is lee over there asked grant pointing up the road having heard a rumor that lee was in that vicinity yes he is in that brick house waiting to surrender to you answered sheridan well then we'll go over said grant the general-in-chief now rode on accompanied by sheridan ord and others soon colonel babcock's orderly was seen sitting on his horse in the street in front of a two-story brick house better in appearance than the rest of the houses he said general lee and colonel babcock had gone into this house half an hour before and he was ordered to post himself in the street and keep a lookout for general grant so as to let him know where general lee was babcock told me afterward that in carrying general grant's last letter he passed through the enemy's lines and found general lee a little more than half a mile beyond appomattox courthouse he was lying down by the roadside on a blanket which had been spread over a few fence rails placed on the ground under an apple tree which was part of an old orchard this circumstance furnished the only ground for the widespread report that the surrender occurred under an apple tree and which has been repeated in song and story there may be said of that statement what cuvier said of the french academy's definition of a crab brilliant but not correct babcock dismounted upon coming near and as he approached lee sat up with his feet hanging over the roadside embankment the wheels of wagons in passing along the road had cut away the earth of this embankment and left the roots of the trees projecting lee's feet were partly resting on these roots colonel charles marshall his military secretary came forward took the dispatch which babcock handed him and gave it to general lee after reading it the general rose and said he would ride forward on the road on which babcock had come but was apprehensive that hostilities might begin in the meantime upon the termination of the temporary truce and asked babcock to write a line to meade informing him of the situation babcock wrote accordingly requesting meade to maintain the truce until positive orders from grant could be received to save time it was arranged that a union officer accompanied by one of lee's officers should carry this letter through the enemy's lines this route made the distance to meade nearly ten miles shorter than by the roundabout way of the union lines lee now mounted his horse and directed colonel marshall to accompany him they started for appomattox courthouse in company with babcock followed by a mounted orderly 
when the party reached the village they met one of its residents named wilmer mclean who was told that general lee wished to occupy a convenient room in some house in the town mclean ushered them into the sitting-room of one of the first houses he came to but upon looking about and seeing that it was small and unfurnished lee proposed finding something more commodious and better fitted for the occasion mclean then conducted the party to his own house about the best one in the town where they awaited general grant's arrival the house had a comfortable wooden porch with seven steps leading up to it a hall ran through the middle from front to back and upon each side was a room having two windows one in front and one in rear each room had two doors opening into the hall the building stood a little distance back from the street with a yard in front and to the left on entering was a gate for carriages and a roadway running to a stable in rear we entered the grounds by this gate and dismounted in the yard were seen a fine large gray horse which proved to be general lee's favorite animal named traveller and a good-looking dark-colored mare belonging to colonel marshall an orderly in gray was in charge of them and had taken off their bridles to let them crop the grass general grant mounted the steps and entered the house as he stepped into the hall colonel babcock who had seen his approach from the window opened the door of the room on the left in which he had been sitting with general lee and colonel marshall awaiting general grant's arrival the general passed in and as lee arose and stepped forward grant extended his hand saying general lee and the two shook hands cordially the members of the staff general sheridan and ord and some other general officers who had gathered in the front yard remained outside feeling that general grant would probably prefer his first interview with general lee to be in a measure private in a few minutes colonel babcock came to the front door and making a motion with his hat toward the sitting-room said the general says come in it was then about half-past one on sunday the ninth of april we entered and found general grant seated in an old office armchair in the centre of the room and lee sitting in a plain armchair with a cane seat beside a square marble-topped table near the front window in the corner opposite the door by which we entered and facing general grant colonel marshall was standing at his left with his right elbow resting upon the mantelpiece we walked in softly and ranged ourselves quietly about the sides of the room very much as people enter a sick chamber when they expect to find the patient dangerously ill some found seats on the sofa standing against the wall between the two doors and on the few plain chairs which constituted the furniture but most of the party stood the contrast between the two commanders was singularly striking and could not fail to attract marked attention as they sat six or eight feet apart facing each other general grant then nearly forty-three years of age was five feet eight inches in height with shoulders slightly stooped his hair and full beard were nut brown without a trace of gray in them he had on his single-breasted blouse of dark blue flannel unbuttoned in front and showing a waistcoat underneath he wore an ordinary pair of top boots with his trousers inside and was without spurs the boots and portions of his clothes were spattered with mud he had worn a pair of thread gloves of a dark yellow color which he had taken off on entering the room his felt sugar-loaf stiff-brimmed hat was resting on his lap he had no sword or sash and a pair of shoulder straps was all there was about him to designate his rank in fact aside from these his uniform was that of a private soldier lee on the other hand was six feet and one inch in height and erect for one of his age for he was grant senior by sixteen years his hair and full beard were a silver gray and thick except that the hair had become a little thin in front he wore a new uniform of confederate gray buttoned to the throat and a handsome sword and sash the sword was of exceedingly fine workmanship and the hilt was studded with jewels it had been presented to him by some ladies in england who sympathized with the cause he represented his top boots were comparatively new and had on them near the top some ornamental stitching of red silk like his uniform they were clean on the boots were handsome spurs with large rowels 
a felt hat which in color matched pretty closely that of his uniform and a pair of long gray buckskin gauntlets lay beside him on the table we endeavored afterward to learn how it was that he wore such fine clothes and looked so much as if he had turned out to go to church that sunday afternoon while with us our outward garb scarcely rose to the dignity even of the shabby genteel one explanation was that when his headquarters wagons had been pressed so closely by our cavalry a few days before it was found that his officers would have to destroy all their baggage except the clothes they carried on their backs and each one naturally selected the newest suit he had and sought to propitiate the god of destruction by a sacrifice of his second best another reason given was that in deference to general grant general lee had dressed himself with special care for the purpose of the meeting grant began the conversation by saying i met you once before general lee while we were serving in mexico when you came over from general scott's headquarters to visit garland's brigade to which i then belonged i have always remembered your appearance and i think i should have recognized you anywhere yes replied general lee i know i met you on that occasion and i have often thought of it and tried to recollect how you looked but i have never been able to recall a single feature after some further mention of mexico general lee said i suppose general grant that the object of our present meeting is fully understood i asked to see you to ascertain upon what terms you would receive the surrender of my army general grant replied the terms i propose are those stated substantially in my letter of yesterday that is the officers and men surrendered to be paroled and disqualified from taking up arms again until properly exchanged and all arms ammunition and supplies to be delivered up as captured property lee nodded an assent and said those are about the conditions which i expected would be proposed general grant then continued yes i think our correspondence indicated pretty clearly the action that would be taken at our meeting and i hope it may lead to a general suspension of hostilities and be the means of preventing any further loss of life lee inclined his head as indicating his accord with this wish and general grant then went on to talk at some length in a very pleasant vein about the prospects of peace lee was evidently anxious to proceed to the formal work of the surrender and he brought the subject up again by saying i presume general grant we have both carefully considered the proper steps to be taken and i would suggest that you commit to writing the terms you have proposed so that they may be formally acted upon very well replied grant i will write them out and calling for his manifold order book he opened it laid it on a small oval wooden table which colonel parker brought to him from the rear of the room and proceeded to write the terms the leaves had been so prepared that three impressions of the writing were made he wrote very rapidly and did not pause until he had finished the sentence ending with officers appointed by me to receive them then he looked toward lee and his eyes seemed to be resting on the handsome sword that hung at that officer's side he said afterward that this set him to thinking that it would be an unnecessary humiliation to require the officers to surrender their swords and a great hardship to deprive them of their personal baggage and horses and after a short pause he wrote the sentence this will not embrace the side-arms of the officers nor their private horses or baggage when he had finished the letter he called colonel parker to his side and looked it over with him and directed him as they went along to interline six or seven words and to strike out the word there which had been repeated when this had been done the general took the manifold writer in his right hand extended his arm toward lee and started to rise from his chair to hand the book to him as i was standing equally distant from them with my back to the front window i stepped forward took the book and passed it to general lee the terms were as follows appomattox court house virginia april nine eighteen sixty five general r e lee commanding c s a general in accordance with the substance of my letter to you of the eighth instant i propose to receive the surrender of the army of northern virginia on the following terms to wit rolls of all the officers and men to be made in duplicate 
one copy to be given to an officer to be designated by me the other to be retained by such officer or officers as you may designate the officers to give their individual paroles not to take up arms against the government of the united states until properly exchanged and each company or regimental commander to sign a like parole for the men of their commands the arms artillery and public property to be parked and stacked and turned over to the officers appointed by me to receive them this will not embrace the side arms of the officers nor their private horses or baggage this done each officer and man will be allowed to return to his home not to be disturbed by the united states authorities so long as they observe their paroles and the laws in force where they may reside very respectfully u s grant lieutenant-general lee pushed aside some books and two brass candlesticks which were on the table then took the book and laid it down before him while he drew from his pocket a pair of steel-rimmed spectacles and wiped the glasses carefully with his handkerchief he crossed his legs adjusted the spectacles very slowly and deliberately took up the draft of the terms and proceeded to read them attentively they consisted of two pages when he reached the top line of the second page he looked up and said to general grant after the words until properly the word exchanged seems to be omitted you doubtless intended to use that word why yes said grant i thought i had put in the word exchanged i presumed it had been omitted inadvertently continued lee and with your permission i will mark where it should be inserted certainly grant replied lee felt in his pocket as if searching for a pencil but he did not seem to be able to find one seeing this i handed him my lead pencil during the rest of the interview he kept twirling this pencil in his fingers and occasionally tapping the top of the table with it when he handed it back it was carefully treasured by me as a memento of the occasion when lee came to the sentence about the officer's side-arms private horses and baggage he showed for the first time during the reading of the letter a slight change of countenance and was evidently touched by this act of generosity it was doubtless the condition mentioned to which he particularly alluded when he looked toward general grant as he finished reading and said with some degree of warmth in his manner this will have a very happy effect upon my army general grant then said unless you have some suggestions to make in regard to the form in which i have stated the terms i will have a copy of the letter made in ink and sign it there is one thing i should like to mention lee replied after a short pause the cavalrymen and artilleries own their own horses in our army its organization in this respect differs from that of the united states this expression attracted the notice of our officers present as showing how firmly the conviction was grounded in his mind that we were two distinct countries he continued i should like to understand whether these men will be permitted to retain their horses you will find that the terms as written do not allow this general grant replied only the officers are permitted to take their private property lee read over the second page of the letter again and then said no i see the terms do not allow it that is clear his face showed plainly that he was quite anxious to have this concession made and grant said very promptly and without giving lee time to make a direct request well the subject is quite new to me of course i did not know that any private soldiers owned their animals but i think we have fought the last battle of the war i sincerely hope so and that the surrender of this army will be followed soon by that of all the others and i take it that most of the men in the ranks are small farmers and as the country has been so raided by the two armies it is doubtful whether they will be able to put in a crop to carry themselves and their families through the next winter without the aid of the horses they are now riding and i will arrange it in this way i will not change the terms as now written but i will instruct the officers i shall appoint to receive the paroles to let all the men who claim to own a horse or mule take the animals home with them to work their little farms this expression has been quoted in various forms and has been the subject of some dispute i give the exact words used lee now looked greatly relieved and though anything but a demonstrative man he gave every evidence of his appreciation of this concession and said 
this will have the best possible effect upon the men it will be very gratifying and will do much toward conciliating our people he handed the draft of the terms back to general grant who called colonel t s bowers of the staff to him and directed him to make a copy in ink bowers was a little nervous and he turned the matter over to colonel parker whose handwriting presented a better appearance than that of any one else on the staff parker sat down to write at the oval table which he had moved again to the rear of the room wilmer mclean's domestic resources in the way of ink now became the subject of a searching investigation but it was found that the contents of the conical-shaped stoneware inkstand with a paper stopper which he produced appeared to be participating in the general breaking up and had disappeared colonel marshall now came to the rescue and took from his pocket a small boxwood inkstand which was put at parker's service so that after all we had to fall back upon the resources of the enemy to furnish the stage properties for the final scene in the memorable military drama colonel marshall then took a seat on the sofa beside sheridan and ingalls when the terms had been copied lee directed his military secretary to draw up for his signature a letter of acceptance colonel marshall wrote out a draft of such a letter making it formal beginning with i have the honor to acknowledge etc general lee took it and after reading it over very carefully directed that these formal expressions be stricken out and that the letter be otherwise shortened he afterwards went over it again and seemed to change some words and then told the colonel to make a final copy in ink when it came to providing the paper it was found that we had the only supply of that important ingredient in the recipe for surrendering an army so we gave a few pages to the colonel the letter when completed read as follows headquarters army of northern virginia april ninth eighteen sixty five general i have received your letter of this date containing the terms of the surrender of the army of northern virginia as proposed by you as they are substantially the same as those expressed in your letter of the eighth instant they are accepted i will proceed to designate the proper officers to carry the stipulations into effect very respectfully your obedient servant r e lee general lieutenant general u s grant commanding armies of the u s while the letters were being copied general grant introduced the general officers who had entered and each member of the staff to general lee the general shook hands with general seth williams who had been his adjutant when lee was superintendent at west point some years before the war and gave his hand to some of the other officers who had extended theirs but to most of those who were introduced he merely bowed in a dignified and formal manner he did not exhibit the slightest change of features during this ceremony until colonel parker of our staff was presented to him parker being a full-blooded indian when lee saw his swarthy features he looked at him with evident surprise and his eyes rested on him for several seconds what was passing in his mind no one knew but the natural surmise was that he at first mistook parker for a negro and was struck with astonishment to find that the commander of the union armies had one of that race on his personal staff lee did not utter a word while the introductions were going on except to seth williams with whom he talked cordially williams at one time referred in a rather jocose manner to a circumstance which had occurred during their former service together as if he wished to say something in a good-natured way to thaw the frigidity of the conversation but lee was in no mood for pleasantries and he did not unbend or even relax the fixed sternness of his features his only response to the remark was a slight inclination of the head general lee now took the initiative again in leading the conversation back into business channels he said i have a thousand or more of your men as prisoners general grant a number of them officers whom we have required to march along with us for several days i shall be glad to send them into your lines as soon as it can be arranged for i have no provisions for them i have indeed nothing for my own men they have been living for the last few days principally upon parched corn and we are badly in need of both rations and forage i telegraphed to lynchburg directing several trainloads of rations to be sent on by rail from there and when they arrive i should be glad to have the present wants of my men supplied from them 
at this remark all eyes turned toward sheridan for he had captured these trains with his cavalry the night before near appomattox station general grant replied i should like to have our men sent within our lines as soon as possible i will take steps at once to have your army supplied with rations but i am sorry to have no forage for the animals we have had to depend upon the country for our supply of forage of about how many men does your present force consist indeed i am not able to say lee answered after a slight pause my losses in killed and wounded have been exceedingly heavy and besides there have been many stragglers and some deserters all my reports and public papers and indeed some of my own private letters had to be destroyed on the march to prevent them from falling into the hands of your people many companies are entirely without officers and i have not seen any returns for several days so that i have no means of ascertaining our present strength general grant had taken great pains to have a daily estimate made of the enemy's forces from all the data that could be obtained and judging it to be about twenty five thousand at that time he said suppose i send over twenty five thousand rations do you think that will be a sufficient supply i think it will be ample replied lee and added with considerable earnestness of manner and it will be a great relief i assure you general grant now turned to his chief commissary colonel m r morgan who was present and directed him to arrange for issuing the rations the number of officers and men surrendered was over twenty eight thousand as to general grant's supplies he had ordered the army on starting out to carry twelve days rations this was the twelfth and last day of the campaign grant's eye now fell upon lee's sword again and it seemed to remind him of the absence of his own and by way of explanation and so that it could not be construed as a discourtesy he said to lee i started out from my camp several days ago without my sword and as i have not seen my headquarters baggage since i have been riding about without any side arms i have generally worn a sword however as little as possible only during the active operations of a campaign i am in the habit of wearing mine most of the time remarked lee when i am among my troops moving about through the army general sheridan now stepped up to general lee and said that when he discovered some of the confederate troops in motion during the morning which seemed to be a violation of the truce he had sent him lee a couple of notes protesting against this act and as he had not had time to copy them he would like to have them long enough to make copies lee took the notes out of the breast pocket of his coat and handed them to sheridan with a few words expressive of regret that the circumstances should have occurred and intimating that it must have been the result of some misunderstanding after a little general conversation had been indulged in by those present the two letters were signed grant signed the terms on the oval table which was moved up to him again for the purpose lee signed his letter of acceptance on the marble-topped table at which he sat colonel parker folded up the terms and gave them to colonel marshall marshall handed lee's acceptance to parker end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty one after the surrender grant's final conference with lee the dawn of peace grant avoids a visit to richmond his respect for religion grant's enthusiastic reception at washington his last interview with lincoln john wilkes booth shadows grant grant's interrupted journey lincoln's assassination before parting lee asked grant to notify meade of the surrender fearing that fighting might break out on that front and lives be uselessly lost this request was complied with and two union officers were sent through the enemy's lines as the shortest route to meade some of lee's officers accompanying them to prevent their being interfered with a little before four o'clock general lee shook hands with general grant bowed to the other officers and with colonel marshall left the room one after another we followed and passed out to the porch lee signalled to his orderly to bring up his horse and while the animal was being bridled the general stood on the lowest step and gazed sadly in the direction of the valley beyond where his army lay 
now an army of prisoners he thrice smote the palm of his left hand slowly with his right fist in an absent sort of way seemed not to see the group of union officers in the yard who rose respectfully at his approach and appeared unaware of everything about him all appreciated the sadness that overwhelmed him and he had the personal sympathy of every one who beheld him at this supreme moment of trial the approach of his horse seemed to recall him from his reverie and he at once mounted general grant now stepped down from the porch moving toward him and saluted him by raising his hat he was followed in this act of courtesy by all our officers present lee raised his hat respectfully and rode off at a slow trot to break the sad news to the brave fellows whom he had so long commanded general grant and his staff then started for the headquarters camp which in the meantime had been pitched near by the news of the surrender had reached the union lines and the firing of salutes began at several points but the general sent an order at once to have them stopped using these words the war is over the rebels are our countrymen again and the best sign of rejoicing after the victory will be to abstain from all demonstrations in the field this was in keeping with his order issued after the surrender of vicksburg the paroled prisoners will be sent out of here to-morrow instruct commanders to be orderly and quiet as these prisoners pass and to make no offensive remarks there were present in the room in which the surrender occurred besides sheridan ord merritt custer and the officers of grant's staff a number of other officers and one or two citizens who entered the room at different times during the interview mr mclean had been charging about in a manner which indicated that the excitement was shaking his nervous system to its centre but his real trials did not begin until the departure of the chief actors in the surrender then the relic hunters charged down upon the manor-house and began to bargain for the numerous pieces of furniture sheridan paid the proprietor twenty dollars in gold for the table on which general grant wrote the terms of surrender for the purpose of presenting it to mrs custer and handed it over to her dashing husband who galloped off to camp bearing it upon his shoulder ord paid forty dollars for the table at which lee sat and afterwards presented it to mrs grant who modestly declined it and insisted that mrs ord should become its possessor general sharp paid ten dollars for the pair of brass candlesticks colonel sheridan the general's brother secured the stone inkstand and general capehart the chair in which grant sat which he gave not long before his death to captain wilman w blackmar of boston captain o'farrell of hartford became the possessor of the chair in which lee sat a child's doll was found in the room which the younger officers tossed from one to the other and called the silent witness this toy was taken possession of by colonel moore of sheridan's staff and is now owned by his son bargains were at once struck for nearly all the articles in the room and it is even said that some mementos were carried off for which no coin of the republic was ever exchanged the sofa remains in possession of mrs spillman mr mclean's daughter who now lives in camden west virginia colonel marshall presented the boxwood inkstand to mr blanchard of baltimore of the three impressions of the terms of surrender made in general grant's manifold writer the first and third are believed to have been accidentally destroyed no trace of them has since been discovered the second is in the possession of the new york commandery of the military order of the loyal legion which purchased it recently from the widow of general parker the headquarters flag which had been used throughout the entire virginia campaign general grant presented to me with his assent i gave a portion of it to colonel babcock it is a singular historical coincidence that mclean's former home was upon a virginia farm near the battleground of the first bull run and his house was used for a time as the headquarters of general beauregard when it was found that this fight was so popular that it was given an encore and a second battle of bull run was fought the next year on the same ground mr mclean became convinced that the place was altogether lacking in repose and to avoid the active theatre of war he removed to the quiet village of appomattox only to find himself again surrounded by contending armies 
thus the first and last scenes of the war drama in virginia were enacted upon his property before general grant had proceeded far toward camp he was reminded that he had not yet announced the important event to the government he dismounted by the roadside sat down on a large stone and called for pencil and paper colonel badeau handed his order book to the general who wrote on one of the leaves the following message a copy of which was sent to the nearest telegraph station it was dated four thirty p m hon e m stanton secretary of war washington general lee surrendered the army of northern virginia this afternoon on terms proposed by myself the accompanying additional correspondence will show the conditions fully u s grant lieutenant general upon reaching camp he seated himself in front of his tent notwithstanding the slight shower which was then falling and we all gathered about him curious to hear what his first comments would be upon the crowning event of his life but our expectations were doomed to disappointment for he appeared to have already dismissed the whole subject from his mind and turning to the chief quartermaster his first words were ingalls do you remember that old white mule that so-and-so used to ride when we were in the city of mexico why perfectly said ingalls who was just then in a mood to remember the exact number of hairs in the mule's tail if it would have helped to make matters agreeable and then the general-in-chief went on to recall the antics played by that animal during an excursion to popocatepetl it was not until after dinner that he said much about the surrender when he spoke freely of his entire belief that the rest of the confederate commanders would follow lee's example and that we should have but little more fighting even of a partisan nature he then surprised us by announcing his intention of starting for washington early the next morning we were disappointed at this for we wished to see something of the opposing army now that it had become civil enough for the first time in its existence to let us get close up to it and to meet some of the officers who had been acquaintances in former years the general however had no desire to look at the conquered indeed he had little curiosity in his nature and he was anxious above all things to begin the reduction of the military establishment and diminish the enormous expense attending it which at this time amounted to nearly four millions of dollars a day when he considered however that the railroad was being rapidly put in condition as far as burkeville and that he would lose no time by waiting till noon of the next day he made up his mind to delay his departure about nine o'clock on the morning of april ten grant with his staff rode out toward the enemy's lines but it was found upon attempting to pass through that the force of habit is hard to overcome and that the practice which had so long been inculcated in lee's army of keeping grant out of its lines was not to be overturned in a day and he was politely requested at the picket lines to wait till a message could be sent to headquarters asking for instructions as soon as lee heard that his distinguished opponent was approaching he was prompt to correct the misunderstanding at the picket line and rode out at a gallop to receive him they met on a knoll that overlooked the lines of the two armies and saluted respectfully by each raising his hat the officers present gave a similar salute and then withdrew out of earshot and grouped themselves about the two chieftains in a semicircle general grant repeated to us that evening the substance of the conversation which was as follows grant began by expressing a hope that the war would soon be over and lee replied by stating that he had for some time been anxious to stop the further effusion of blood and he trusted that everything would now be done to restore harmony and conciliate the people of the south he said the emancipation of the negroes would be no hindrance to the restoring of relations between the two sections of the country as it would probably not be the desire of the majority of the southern people to restore slavery then even if the question were left open to them he could not tell what the other armies would do or what course mr davis would now take but he believed that it would be best for the other armies to follow his example as nothing could be gained by further resistance in the field 
finding that he entertained these sentiments general grant told him that no one's influence in the south was so great as his and suggested to him that he should advise the surrender of the remaining armies and thus exert his influence in favor of immediate peace lee said he could not take such a course without first consulting president davis grant then proposed to lee that he should do so and urge the hastening of a result which was admitted to be inevitable lee however in this instance was averse to stepping beyond his duties as a soldier and said the authorities would doubtless soon arrive at the same conclusion without his interference there was a statement put forth that grant asked lee to see mr lincoln and talk with him as to the terms of reconstruction but this was erroneous i asked general grant about it when he was on his deathbed and his recollection was distinct that he had made no such suggestion i am of opinion that the mistake arose from hearing that lee had been requested to go and see the president regarding peace and thinking that this expression referred to mr lincoln whereas it referred to mr davis after the conversation had lasted a little more than half an hour and lee had requested that instructions be given to the officers left in charge to carry out the details of the surrender that there might be no misunderstanding as to the form of paroles the manner of turning over the property etc the conference ended the two commanders lifted their hats and bade each other good-bye lee rode back to his camp to take a final farewell of his army and grant returned to mclean's house where he sat on the porch until it was time to take his final departure it will be observed that grant at no time actually entered the enemy's lines Engels, sheridan and williams had asked permission to visit the enemy's lines and renew their acquaintance with some old friends classmates and former comrades in arms who were serving in lee's army they now returned bringing with them general cadmus m wilcox who had been one of general grant's groomsmen longstreet who had also been at his wedding heth who had been a subaltern with him in mexico besides gordon pickett and a number of others they all stepped up to pay their respects to general grant who received them very cordially and talked frankly and pleasantly with them until it was time to leave they manifested a deep appreciation of the terms which had been accorded to them in the articles of surrender but several of them expressed some apprehension as to the civil processes which might ensue and the measures which might be taken by the government as to confiscation of property and trial for treason the hour of noon had now arrived and general grant after shaking hands with all present who were not to accompany him mounted his horse and started with his staff for burkeville lee set out for richmond and it was felt by all that peace had at last dawned upon the land the charges were now withdrawn from the guns the campfires were left to smoulder in their ashes the horses were detached from the cannon to be hitched to the plough and the army of the union and the army of northern virginia turned their backs upon each other for the first time in four long bloody years in this campaign from march twenty nine to april nine the union loss was one thousand three hundred and sixteen killed seven thousand seven hundred and fifty wounded and one thousand seven hundred and fourteen prisoners a total of ten thousand seven hundred and eighty the enemy lost about twelve hundred killed six thousand wounded and seventy five thousand prisoners including the capture at appomattox the repairers of the railroad had thought more of haste than of solidity of construction and the special train bearing the general-in-chief from burkeville to city point ran off the track three times these mishaps caused much delay and instead of reaching city point that evening he did not arrive until daylight the next morning april eleven a telegram had been sent to mrs grant who had remained aboard the headquarters steamboat telling her that we should get there in time for dinner and she had prepared the best meal which the boat's larder could afford to help to celebrate the victory she and mrs rawlins and mrs morgan who were with her whiled away the long and anxious hours of the night by playing the piano singing and discussing the victory but just before daylight the desire for sleep overcame them and they lay down to take a nap 
soon after our tired and hungry party arrived the general went hurriedly aboard the boat and ran at once up the stairs to mrs grant's stateroom she was somewhat chagrined that she had not remained up to receive her husband now more than ever her victor but she had merely thrown herself upon the berth without undressing and soon joined us all in the cabin and extended to us enthusiastic greetings and congratulations the belated dinner now served in good stead as a breakfast for our famished party the general was asked whether he was going to run up to richmond on the steamer and take a look at the captured city before starting for washington he replied no i think it would be as well not to go i could do no good there and my visit might lead to demonstrations which would only wound the feelings of the residents and we ought not to do anything at such a time which would add to their sorrow and then added but if any of you have a curiosity to see the city i will wait till you can take a trip there and back for i cannot well leave here for washington anyhow till to-morrow several of us put our horses aboard a boat and started up the james as a portion of the river was supposed to be planted with torpedoes we sat close to the stern believing that in case of accident the bow would receive the main shock of the explosion we reached the lower wharf of richmond in safety put our horses ashore and rode about for an hour looking at the city upon which we had laid covetous eyes for so many months the evacuation had been accompanied by many acts of destruction and the fire which our troops found blazing when they entered had left a third of the place smouldering in ashes the white population were keeping closely to their houses while the blacks were running wildly about the streets in every direction upon our return that evening to city point we found aboard the headquarters boat a clergyman a member of the christian commission who was personally acquainted with the general he had called to see him to tender his congratulations and during their conversation made the remark i have observed general grant that a great many battles in our war have been fought on sunday shiloh occurred on that day the surrender of donelson chancellorsville the capture of petersburg the surrender at appomattox and i think some other important military events how has this happened it is quite true replied the general of course it was not intentional and i think that sometimes perhaps it has been the result of the very efforts which have been made to avoid it you see a commander when he can control his own movements usually intends to start out early in the week so as not to bring on an engagement on sunday but delays occur often at the last moment and it may be the middle of the week before he gets his troops in motion then more time is spent than anticipated in manoeuvring for position and when the fighting actually begins it is the end of the week and the battle particularly if it continues a couple of days runs into sunday it is unfortunate remarked the clergyman yes very unfortunate observed the general every effort should be made to respect the sabbath day and it is very gratifying to know that it is observed so generally throughout our country it was always noticeable that he had a strict regard for the sabbath and this feeling continued through life he never played a game of any kind on that day nor wrote any official correspondence if he could help it he had been brought up a methodist and regularly attended worship in the methodist episcopal church but he was entirely non-sectarian in his feelings he had an intimate acquaintance among clergymen and counted many of them among his closest friends he rarely if ever spoke about his own religious convictions it was one of those subjects not to be discussed lightly and was so purely personal that he naturally shrank from dwelling upon it for he always avoided talking upon any subject which was personal to himself there was such a total lack of egotism in his nature that he could not see how anything touching his own personality could be of interest to others he was imbued with a deep reverence however for all subjects of a religious nature and nothing was more offensive to him than an attempt to make light of serious matters or to show a disrespect for sacred things his correspondence makes mention of his recognition of an overruling providence in all the affairs of this world and in his speech to mr lincoln accepting the commission of lieutenant-general he closed with the words 
i feel the full weight of the responsibilities now devolving on me and i know that if they are met it will be due to those armies and above all to the favor of that providence which leads both nations and men he was always a liberal contributor to church work and in fact to every good cause his fault was that he was not sufficiently discriminating every mail brought begging letters and he gave away sums out of all proportion to his means when payday came it took all the persuasions of those about him to prevent him from parting in this way with the greater part of his pay his only source of revenue preparations were made to break up headquarters and the next afternoon the party started by steamer for washington reached there the morning of the thirteenth and took up their quarters at willard's hotel it soon became noised about that the conqueror of the rebellion had arrived in the city and dense crowds thronged the streets upon which the hotel fronted during the forenoon the general started for the war department his appearance in the street was a signal for an improvised reception in which shouts of welcome rent the air and the populace joined in a demonstration which was thrilling in its earnestness he had the greatest difficulty in making his way over even the short distance between the hotel and the department at one time it was thought he would have to take to a carriage as a means of refuge but by the interposition of the police he finally reached his destination that afternoon the secretary of war published an order stating that after mature consideration and consultation with the lieutenant-general it was decided to stop all drafting and recruiting curtail the purchases of supplies reduce the number of officers and remove restrictions on commerce as far as consistent with public safety this was a sort of public declaration of peace and the city gave itself over to rejoicing bands were everywhere heard playing triumphant strains and crowds traversed the streets shouting approval and singing patriotic airs the general was the hero of the hour and the idol of the people his name was on every lip congratulations poured in upon him and blessings were heaped upon him by all general grant visited the president and had a most pleasant interview with him the next day friday being a cabinet day he was invited to meet the cabinet officers at their meeting in the forenoon he went to the white house receiving the cordial congratulations of all present and discussed with them the further measures which should be taken for bringing hostilities to a speedy close in this interview mr lincoln gave a singular manifestation of the effect produced upon him by dreams when general grant expressed some anxiety regarding the delay in getting news from sherman the president assured him that favorable news would soon be received because he had had the night before his usual dream which always preceded favorable tidings the same dream which he had had the night before antietam murfreesboro gettysburg and vicksburg he seemed to be aboard a curious-looking vessel moving rapidly toward a dark and indefinite shore this time alas the dream was not to be the precursor of good news the president and mrs lincoln invited the general and mrs grant to go to ford's theatre and occupy a box with them to see our american cousin the general said he would be very sorry to have to decline but that mrs grant and he had made arrangements to go to burlington new jersey to see their children and he feared it would be a great disappointment to his wife to delay the trip the president remarked that the people would be so delighted to see the general that he ought to stay and attend the play on that account the general however had been so completely besieged by the people since his arrival and was so constantly the subject of outbursts of enthusiasm that it had become a little embarrassing to him and the mention of a demonstration in his honor at the theatre did not appeal to him as an argument in favor of going a note was now brought to him from mrs grant expressing increased anxiety to start for burlington on the four o'clock train and he told the president that he must decide definitely not to remain for the play it was probably this declination which saved the general from assassination as it was learned afterward that he had been marked for a victim it was after two o'clock when he shook mr lincoln's hand and said good-bye to him little thinking that it would be an eternal farewell and that an appalling tragedy was soon to separate them forever
their final leave-taking was only thirteen months after their first meeting but during that time their names had been associated with enough momentous events to fill whole volumes of a nation's history the general went at once to his rooms at the hotel as soon as he entered mrs grant said to him when i went to my lunch to-day a man with a wild look followed me into the dining-room took a seat nearly opposite to me at the table stared at me continually and seemed to be listening to my conversation the general replied oh i suppose he did so merely from curiosity in fact the general by this time had become so accustomed to having people stare at him and the members of his family that such acts had ceased to attract his attention about half-past three o'clock the wife of general rucker called with her carriage to take the party to the baltimore and ohio railroad station it was a two-seated top carriage mrs grant sat with mrs rucker on the back seat the general with true republican simplicity sat on the front seat with the driver before they had gone far along pennsylvania avenue a horseman who was riding in the same direction passed them and as he did so peered into the carriage when mrs grant caught sight of his face she remarked to the general that is the same man who sat down at the lunch table near me i don't like his looks before they reached the station the horseman turned and rode back toward them and again gazed at them intently this time he attracted the attention of the general who regarded the man's movements as singular but made light of the matter so as to allay mrs grant's apprehensions on their arrival at the station they were conducted to the private car of mr garrett then president of the baltimore and ohio railway company before the train reached baltimore a man appeared on the front platform of the car and tried to get in but the conductor had locked the door so that the general would not be troubled by visitors and the man did not succeed in entering the general and mrs grant drove across philadelphia about midnight from the broad street and washington avenue station to the walnut street wharf on the delaware river for the purpose of crossing the ferry and then taking the cars to burlington as the general had been detained so long at the white house that he was not able to get luncheon before starting and as there was an additional ride in prospect a stop was made at bloodgood's hotel near the ferry for the purpose of getting supper the general had just taken his seat with mrs grant at the table in the supper-room when a telegram was brought in and handed to him his whereabouts was known to the telegraph people from the fact that he had sent a message to blood goods ordering the supper in advance the general read the dispatch dropped his head and sat in perfect silence then came another and still another dispatch but not a word was spoken mrs grant now broke the silence by saying ulyss what do the telegrams say do they bring any bad news i will read them to you the general replied in a voice which betrayed his emotion but first prepare yourself for the most painful and startling news that could be received and control your feelings so as not to betray the nature of the dispatches to the servants he then read to her the telegrams conveying the appalling announcement that mr lincoln mr seward and probably the vice president mr johnson had been assassinated and warning the general to look out for his own safety a special train was at once ordered to take him back to washington but finding that he could take mrs grant to burlington less than an hour's ride and return to philadelphia nearly as soon as his train could be got ready he continued on took her to her destination returned to philadelphia and was in washington the next morning it was found that the president had been shot and killed at ford's theater by john wilkes booth that mr seward had received severe but not fatal injuries at the hands of payne who attempted his assassination but that no attack had been made on the vice-president when the likenesses of booth appeared they resembled so closely the mysterious man who had followed the general and mrs grant on their way to the rail station at washington that there remained no doubt that he had intended to be the president's assassin and was bent upon ascertaining the movements of the general-in-chief an anonymous letter was afterward received by the general saying that the writer had been designated by the conspirators to assassinate him and had been ordered by booth to board the train and commit the deed there 
that he had attempted to enter the special car for this purpose but that it was locked and he was thus baffled and that he thanked god that this circumstance had been the means of preventing him from staining his hands with the blood of so great and good a man washington as well as the whole country was plunged in an agony of grief and the excitement knew no bounds stanton's grief was uncontrollable and at the mention of mr lincoln's name he would break down and weep bitterly general grant and the secretary of war busied themselves day and night in pushing a relentless pursuit of the conspirators who were caught and were brought to trial before a military commission except booth who was shot in an attempt to capture him john h surratt who escaped from the country was captured and tried years later the jury disagreeing as to his guilt i was appointed a member of the court which was to try the prisoners the defense however raised the objection that as i was a member of general grant's military family and as it was claimed that he was one of the high officials who was an intended victim of the assassins i was disqualified from sitting in judgment upon them the court very properly sustained the objection and i was relieved and another officer was substituted however i sat one day at the trial which was interesting from the fact that it afforded an opportunity of seeing the assassins and watching their actions before the court the prisoners heavily manacled were marched into the court-room in solemn procession an armed sentinel accompanying each of them the men's heads were covered with thickly padded hoods with openings for the mouth and nose the hoods had been placed upon them in consequence of powell alias payne having attempted to cheat the gallows by dashing his brains out against a beam on a gunboat on which he had been confined the prisoners whose eyes were thus bandaged were led to their seats the sentinels were posted behind them and the hoods were then removed as the light struck their eyes which for several days had been unaccustomed to its brilliancy the sudden glare gave them great discomfort payne had a wild look in his wandering eyes and his general appearance stamped him as the typical reckless desperado mrs surratt was placed in a chair at a little distance from the men she sat most of the time leaning back with her feet stretched forward she kept up a piteous moaning and frequently called for water which was given her the other prisoners had a stolid look and seemed crushed by the situation End of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty two sherman's terms to joseph e johnston the end of hostilities the grand review at washington grant's place in military history as soon as the surrender at appomattox had taken place general grant dispatched a boat from city point with a message to sherman announcing the event and telling him that he could offer the same terms to johnston on april eighteen sherman entered into an agreement with johnston which embraced political as well as merely military questions but only conditionally and with the understanding that the armistice granted could be terminated if the conditions were not approved by superior authority a staff officer sent by general sherman brought his communication to washington announcing the terms of this agreement it was received by general grant on april twenty one perceiving that the terms covered many questions of a civil and not of a military nature he suggested to the secretary of war that the matter had better be referred at once to president johnson and the cabinet for their action a cabinet meeting was called before midnight and there was a unanimous decision that the basis of agreement should be disapproved and an order was issued directing general grant to proceed in person to sherman's headquarters and direct operations against the enemy instead of merely recognizing that sherman had made an honest mistake in exceeding his authority the president and the secretary of war characterized his conduct as akin to treason and the secretary denounced him in unmeasured terms 
at this general grant grew indignant and gave free expression to his opposition to an attempt to stigmatize an officer whose acts throughout all his career gave ample contradiction to the charge that he was actuated by unworthy motives the form of the public announcement put forth by the war department aroused great public indignation against sherman and it was some time before his motives were fully understood grant started at daybreak on the twenty second proceeded at once to raleigh explained the situation and attitude of the government fully to sherman and directed him to give the required notice for annulling the truce and to demand a surrender of johnston's army on the same terms as those accorded to lee sherman was as usual perfectly loyal and subordinate and made all haste to comply with these instructions when he went out to the front to meet johnston grant remained quietly at raleigh and throughout the negotiations kept himself entirely in the background lest he might seem to share in the honor of receiving the surrender the credit for which he wished to belong wholly to sherman the entire surrender of johnston's forces was promptly concluded having had a talk with the secretary of war soon after general grant's departure and finding him bent upon continuing the denunciation of sherman before the public i started for north carolina to meet general grant and inform him of the situation in washington i passed him however on the way and at once returned and rejoined him at washington hostilities were now brought rapidly to a close throughout the entire theater of war april eleven canby compelled the evacuation of mobile by the twenty first our troops had taken selma tuscaloosa montgomery west point columbus and macon may four richard taylor surrendered the confederate forces east of the mississippi may ten jefferson davis was captured and on the twenty sixth kirby smith surrendered his command west of the mississippi since april eight one thousand six hundred eighty cannon had been captured and a hundred and seventy four thousand two hundred and twenty three confederate soldiers had been paroled there was no longer a rebel in arms the union cause had triumphed slavery was abolished and the national government was again supreme the army of the potomac sheridan's cavalry and sherman's army had all reached the capital by the end of may sheridan could not remain with his famous corps for general grant sent him post haste to the rio grande to look after operations there in a contemplated movement against maximilian's forces who were upholding a monarchy in mexico in violation of the monroe doctrine it was decided that the troops assembled at washington should be marched in review through the nation's capital before being mustered out of service the army of the potomac being senior in date of organization and having been for four years the more direct defense of the capital city was given precedence and may twenty three was designated as the day on which it was to be reviewed during the preceding five days washington had been given over to elaborate preparations for the coming pageant the public buildings were decked with a tasteful array of bunting flags were unfurled from private dwellings arches and transparencies with patriotic mottoes were displayed in every quarter and the spring flowers were fashioned into garlands and played their part the whole city was ready for the most imposing fete day in its history vast crowds of citizens had gathered from neighboring states during the review they filled the stands lined the sidewalks packed the porches and covered even the housetops the weather was superb a commodious stand had been erected on pennsylvania avenue in front of the white house on which were gathered a large number of distinguished officials including the president the members of his cabinet who had won renown in the cabinet of lincoln the acting vice-president justices of the supreme court governors of states senators and representatives the general-in-chief of the army and the captor of atlanta with other generals of rank admirals of the navy and brilliantly uniformed representatives of foreign powers general grant accompanied by the principal members of his staff was one of the earliest to arrive with his customary simplicity and dislike of ostentation he had come on foot through the white house grounds from the headquarters of the army at the corner of seventeenth and f streets grant's appearance was as usual the signal for a boisterous demonstration 
sherman arrived a few minutes later and his reception was scarcely less enthusiastic at nine o'clock the signal gun was fired and the legions took up their march they started from the capital and moved along pennsylvania avenue toward georgetown the width and location of that street made it an ideal thoroughfare for such a purpose martial music from scores of bands filled the air and when familiar war songs were played the spectators along the route joined in shouting the chorus those oftenest sung and most applauded were when this cruel war is over when johnny comes marching home and tramp 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 the boys are marching at the head of the column rode meade crowned with the laurels of four years of warfare the plaudits of the multitude followed him along the entire line of march flowers were thrown in his path and garlands decked his person and his horse he dismounted after having passed the reviewing stand stepped upon the platform and was enthusiastically greeted by all present then came the cavalry with the gallant merritt at their head commanding in the absence of sheridan the public were not slow to make recognition of the fame he had won on so many hard-fought fields conspicuous among the division commanders was custer his long golden locks floated in the wind his low-cut collar his crimson necktie and his buckskin breeches presented a combination which made him look half general and half scout and gave him a daredevil appearance which singled him out for general remark and applause when within two hundred yards of the president's stand his spirited horse took the bit in his teeth and made a dash past the troops rushing by the reviewing officers like a tornado but he found more than a match in custer and was soon checked and forced back to his proper position when the cavalrymen covered with flowers afterward rode by the reviewing officials the people screamed with delight after the cavalry came park who might well feel proud of the prowess of the ninth corps which followed him then griffin riding at the head of the gallant fifth corps then humphreys and the second corps of unexcelled valor wright's sixth corps was greatly missed from the list but its duties kept it in virginia and it was accorded a special review on june eight the men preserved their alignment and distances with an ease which showed their years of training in the field their movements were unfettered their step was elastic and the swaying of their bodies and the swinging of their arms were as measured as the vibrations of a pendulum their muskets shone like a wall of steel the cannon rumbled peacefully over the paved street banks of flowers almost concealing them nothing touched the hearts of the spectators so deeply as the sight of the old war flags as they were carried by those precious standards bullet riddled battle stained many of them but remnants often with not enough left of them to show the names of the battles they had seen some were decked with ribbons and some festooned with garlands everybody was thrilled by the sight eyes were dimmed with tears of gladness and many of the people broke through all restraint rushed into the street and pressed their lips upon the folds of the standards the president was kept busy doffing his hat he had a way of holding it by the brim with his right hand and waving it from left to right and occasionally passing his right arm across his breast and resting the hat on his left shoulder this manual of the hat was original and had probably been practiced with good effect when its wearer was stumping east tennessee as each commander in turn passed the reviewing stand he dismounted and came upon the platform where he paid his respects to the president was presented to the guests and remained during the passage of his command a prominent officer of the engineer brigade while riding by led to a slight commotion on the platform he wore a french chasseur cap which he had had made of a pattern differing from the strict regulation headgear in having an extra amount of cloth between the lower band and the crown as he came opposite the president and raised his sword in saluting he paid an additional mark of respect by bowing his head at the same moment the horse as if catching the spirit of its rider kicked up behind and put down its head 
this unexpected participation of the horse in the salute sent the officer's head still lower and the crown of his cap fell forward letting out the superfluous cloth till it looked like an accordion extended at full length the sight was so ludicrous that several of us who were standing just behind the president burst out into a poorly suppressed laugh this moved him to turn squarely round and glare at us savagely in an attempt to frown down such a lack of dignity before or rather behind the chief magistrate of the nation for nearly seven hours the pageant was watched with unabated interest and when it had faded from view the spectators were eager for the night to pass so that on the morrow the scene might be renewed in the marching of the mighty army of the west the next day the same persons with a few exceptions assembled upon the reviewing stand at nine o'clock sherman's veterans started howard had been relieved of the command of the army of the tennessee to take charge of the freedmen's bureau and instead of leading his old troops he rode with sherman at the head of the column his armless right sleeve giving evidence of his heroism in action sherman unknown by sight to most of the people in the east was eagerly watched for and his appearance awoke great enthusiasm his tall spare figure war-worn face and martial bearing made him all that the people had pictured him he had ridden but a little way before his body was decorated with flowery wreaths and his horse enveloped in garlands as he approached the reviewing stand the bands struck up marching through georgia and played that stirring air with a will this was the signal for renewed demonstrations of delight when he had passed he turned his horse into the white house grounds dismounted and strode rapidly to the platform he advanced to where the president was standing and the two shook hands the members of the cabinet then stepped up to greet him he took their extended hands and had a few pleasant words to say to each of them until stanton reached out his hand then sherman's whole manner changed in an instant a cloud of anger overspread his features and smarting under the wrong the secretary had done him in his published bulletins after the conditional treaty with johnston the general turned abruptly away this rebuff became the sensation of the day there was no personal intercourse between the two men till some time afterward when general grant appeared as usual in the role of peacemaker and brought them together sherman showed a manly spirit of forgiveness in going to see stanton in his last illness manifesting his respect and tendering his sympathy sherman's active mind was crowded with the remembrance of past events and he spent all the day in pointing out the different subdivisions of his army as they moved by and recalling in his pithy and graphic way many of the incidents of the stirring campaigns through which they had passed logan black jack came riding at the head of the army of the tennessee his swarthy features and long coal-black hair giving him the air of a native indian chief the army corps which led the column was the fifteenth commanded by hazen then came the seventeenth under frank p blair now slocum appeared at the head of the army of georgia consisting of the twentieth corps headed by the gallant mower with his bushy whiskers covering his face and looking the picture of a hard fighter and the fourteenth corps headed by jefferson c davis each division was preceded by a pioneer corps of negroes marching in double ranks with picks spades and axes slung across their brawny shoulders their stalwart forms conspicuous by their height but the impedimenta were the novel feature of the march six ambulances followed each division to represent its baggage train and then came the amusing spectacle of sherman's bummers bearing with them the spoils of war the bummers were men who were the forerunners flankers and foragers of the army each one was often his own commanding officer if a bummer was too short-sighted to see the enemy he would go nearer if he was lame he would make it an excuse to disobey an order to retreat if out of reach of supplies he would wear his clothes till there was not enough of his coat left to wad a gun and not enough of his shirt to flag a train he was always last in a retreat and first in an enemy's smoke-house in kindling his campfire he would obey the general order to take only the top rail of the neighboring fences 
but would keep on taking the top rail till there were none of the fences left the trophies of his foraging expeditions which appeared in the review consisted of pack mules loaded with turkeys geese chickens and bacon and here and there a chicken coop strapped on to the saddle with a cackling brood peering out through the slats then came cows goats sheep donkeys crowing roosters and in one instance a chattering monkey mixed with these was a procession of fugitive blacks old men stalwart women and grinning piccaninnies of all sizes and ranging in colour from a raven's wing to a new saddle this portion of the column called forth shouts of laughter and continuous rounds of applause flowers were showered upon the troops in the same profusion as the day before and there was no abatement of the uncontrollable enthusiasm of the vast assemblage of citizens who witnessed the march comparisons were naturally instituted between the eastern and western armies the difference was much less than has been represented the army of the potomac presented a somewhat neater appearance in dress and was a little more precise in its movements sherman's army showed perhaps more of a rough and ready aspect and a devil-may-care spirit both were in the highest degree soldierly and typical representatives of the terrible realism of relentless war at half-past three o'clock the matchless pageant had ceased for two whole days a nation's heroes had been passing in review greeted with bands playing drums beating bells ringing banners flying kerchiefs waving and voices cheering they had made their last march even after every veteran had vanished from sight the crowds kept their places for a time as if still under a spell and unwilling to believe that the marvellous spectacle had actually passed from view it was not a roman triumph designed to gratify the vanity of the victors exhibit their trophies and parade their enchained captives before the multitude it was a celebration of the dawn of peace a declaration of the re-establishment of the union general grant now stood in the front rank of the world's greatest captains he had conquered the most formidable rebellion in the annals of history the armies under his immediate direction in virginia had captured seventy five thousand prisoners and six hundred and eighty nine cannon the armies under his general command had captured in april and may a hundred and forty seven thousand prisoners and nine hundred and ninety seven cannon making a total of two hundred and twenty two thousand prisoners and one thousand six hundred and eighty cannon as the achievement of the forces he controlled footnote these figures relate to the final campaign alone the whole year's capture were of course much larger editor end note most of the conspicuous soldiers in history have risen to prominence by gradual steps but the union commander came before the people with a sudden bound almost the first sight they caught of him was at donelson from that event to the closing triumph of appomattox he was the leader whose name was the harbinger of victory he was unquestionably the most aggressive fighter in the entire list of the world's famous soldiers he never once yielded up a stronghold he had wrested from his foe he kept his pledge religiously to take no backward steps for four years of bloody and relentless war he went steadily forward replacing the banner of his country upon the territory where it had been hauled down he possessed in a striking degree every characteristic of the successful soldier his methods were all stamped with tenacity of purpose originality and ingenuity he depended for his success more upon the powers of invention than of adaptation and the fact that he has been compared at different times to nearly every great commander in history is perhaps the best proof that he was like none of them he realized that in a sparsely settled country with formidable natural obstacles and poor roads and in view of the improvement in range and rapidity of fire in cannon and small arms the european methods of warfare and the rules laid down in many of the books must be abandoned and new means devised to meet the change in circumstances he therefore adopted a more open order of battle made an extensive use of skirmish lines employed cavalry largely as mounted infantry and sought to cultivate the individuality of the soldier instead of making him merely an unthinking part of a compact machine 
he originated the cutting loose from the base of supplies with large armies and living off the invaded country he insisted constantly upon thorough cooperation between the different commands and always aimed to prevent operations of corps or armies which were not part of a joint movement in obedience to a comprehensive plan his marvelous combinations covering half a continent soon wrought the destruction of the confederacy and when he struck lee the final blow the cooperating armies were so placed that there was no escape for the opposing forces and within forty-seven days thereafter every confederate army surrendered to a union army he had no hobby as to the use of any particular arm of the service he naturally placed his main reliance in his infantry but made a more vigorous use of cavalry than any of the generals of his day and was judicious in regulating the amount of his artillery by the character of the country in which he was operating his magnanimity to lee his consideration for his feelings and the generous terms granted him served as a precedent for the subsequent surrenders and had much to do with the bringing about a prompt and absolute cessation of hostilities thus saving the country from a prolonged guerrilla warfare he was possessed of a moral and physical courage which was equal to every emergency in which he was placed he was calm amid excitement patient under trials sure in judgment clear in foresight never depressed by reverses or unduly elated by success he was fruitful in expedients and had a facility of resource and a faculty of adapting the means at hand to the accomplishment of an end which never failed him he possessed an intuitive knowledge of topography which prevented him from ever becoming confused as to locality or direction in conducting even the most complicated movements in the field his singular self-reliance enabled him at critical junctures to decide instantly questions of vital moment without dangerous delay in seeking advice from others and to assume the gravest responsibilities without asking any one to share them his habits of life were simple and he enjoyed a physical constitution which enabled him to endure every form of fatigue and privation incident to military service in the field his soldiers always knew that he was ready to rough it with them and share their hardships on the march he wore no better clothes than they and often ate no better food there was nothing in his manner to suggest that there was any gulf between him and the men who were winning his victories he never tired of giving unstinted praise to his subordinates he was at all times loyal to them his fidelity produced a reciprocal effect and is one of the chief reasons why they became so loyally attached to him he was never betrayed by success into boasting of his triumphs he never underrated himself in a battle he never overrated himself in a report general sheridan in his memoirs says of his chief in speaking of the later campaigns the effect of his discomfitures was to make him all the more determined to discharge successfully the stupendous trust committed to his care and to bring into play the manifold resources of his well-ordered mind he guided every subordinate then and in the last days of the rebellion with a fund of common sense and a superiority of intellect which have left an impress so distinct as to exhibit his great personality when his military history is analyzed after the lapse of years it will show even more clearly than now that during these as well as his previous campaigns he was the steadfast centre about and on which everything else turned general longstreet one of his most persistent foes on the field of battle says in his reminiscences general grant had come to be known as an all-around fighter seldom if ever surpassed but the biggest part of him was his heart and again as the world continues to look at and study the grand combinations and strategy of general grant the higher will be his reward as a soldier while his achievements in actual battle eclipse by their brilliancy the strategy and grand tactics employed in his campaigns yet the extraordinary combinations effected and the skill and boldness exhibited in moving large armies into position should entitle him to as much credit as the qualities he displayed in the immediate presence of the enemy with him the formidable game of war was in the hands of a master <laughs>
End of chapter 32 End of Campaigning with Grant by Horace Porter